Hi there. Welcome to the Strong by Design podcast show. Coach Chris Wilson hosting today. So glad to have you. Uh, thank you for joining our show. If you're a first time listener of our show, well, welcome. Awesome to have you. Uh, we have a lot of episodes for you to go back and enjoy and listen several years worth. Uh, probably every Every topic or subject matter you could possibly think of uh, has been discussed on this show. So we would love for you to go back and scroll and find some other past episodes. But today is going to be a terrific conversation uh, with our very special guest, a, a gentleman who I just uh, came to know recently. And uh, we hit it off right away. And I'm really excited to know his story a little bit more and share that with you. And, uh, and if you're a, a past listener of our show and you've been listening to Strong by Design for a while, so great to have you back. Always a pleasure to be speaking with friends. We consider you friends if you're listeners of the show. You know, we're heard in over 80 countries. Sometimes it's so much fun to go in and look uh, at the platform where we can look at all our analytics and where people are listening and to see people all over the world in Australia or in Japan or in, you know, uh, South American uh, countries. And it's so neat that we're being heard in all these other parts of the globe rather than just here in the United States. And so uh, we appreciate all of you from uh, wherever you're listening in from. So thank you so much. And at the end of this podcast, I'm going to ask you one favor. If you could share this episode, this conversation with one person, with a friend, a family member, somebody who you feel could benefit from what we, we talk about today. Uh, maybe this conversation really touched you emotionally or triggered something. Um, and we would love it if you could share it with somebody. And that, that's really what helps our show grow, right? It's just that, that the word of mouth and the sharing of, of really good stuff. And that's what we're doing on this show. Really good stuff. And uh, we hope that you're living a life strong by design, and today's episode helps you do just that. So thank you for that. So our guest today, Mr. Rustin Webb, a new friend of mine, uh, somebody who I'm super excited to know more about. We've just scratched the surface with some conversations over the last few weeks, and so uh, I'm so eager to get into this today. Uh, Rustin um, is a leading expert in, in what we do here at Critical Bench, in health and fitness, uh, he does uh, quite a bit of mobility training. He has a master's degree in human movement, and he is in the top of his field. He is in that top. He's a top. He's a one percenter. <laughs> all right. This is the guy that uh, you, you can go to when you have fitness and health questions. He, he lives this out in his own life. He's in incredible shape. Uh, he's he's a, a bodybuilder. He's got muscles dripping off of <laughs> all parts of his body. So he's got a tank top on right now. You can see his shoulders. <laughs> all around and everything. It's awesome. He was a gym owner actually for 11 years, helping thousands of clients uh, get out of pain, in, achieve uh, incredible uh, weight loss results, uh, prevent injury, all the things that actually I was doing and loving. Uh, I wasn't a gym owner. I was a, a general manager for several years and a, and a trainer and a coach for several years. And it's so fun working with the public and really helping them go from A to B to, to change their lives, to transform their physiques, to get out of pain, right? to get them moving more and how life changing that can be for people. So this is a guy who, you know, we, we see eye to eye on things with. And he has a brand new platform called The Muscular Gentleman. It's a, it's a movement that he's creating where men together can come together across the globe to not only get healthy and in shape, but observe their masculinity as a fundamental, uh, a fundamental part of their life as, as men, what it means to be masculine. Uh, and, and really soak that up and live that out the right way and how that um, transforms relationships, builds relationships and how it changes society, the need for a good, strong men. So, my man, Rustin, thank you so much for being on Strong by Design. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is great. <laughs> This is great, man. You know, I love that wood. I love the, you know, I got like the crazy background, like my silly, crazy action figure collection and my, my, my bookshelf that has more pictures on it than books. Um, but you got the cool wood, like, did you do that yourself? I'm always curious about like the nice wood backdrop. Yeah, this is a backdrop. So if, if I move my screen here, you can see this is, this oh, okay. is nice right. cloth. It's, but it looks. Oh, get yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. 
that's claw. This is claw. You had you had I, you had, I had, had you. Yeah, it's but it looks so cool when I got it. Um, you know, it was an Amazon purchase, and I, I just loved the wood. And I ended up getting kind of a nice, comfy. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a nice, comfy chair uh, down the street from a store, and then. It's just kind of an easy setup for me to, to do the, you know, my, my podcast and also, you know, my coaching stuff. So, yeah, yeah. no, well, it's, it's, it's so simple and yet, and it's that easy for any of you listening right now, if you're doing any kind of virtual, uh, you know, speaking or podcasting or anything and you need a, a setup, some people really like go crazy, right. And invest hundreds and thousands of dollars. You could, you could get a, a like basically a, a nice, um, what do I want to say? It, it's not like a blanket, but yeah. like a, um, a backdrop. I think a, it was, a canvas type right. thing. And this was like, I want to say it was like thirty nine dollars. I don't want to give away all my secrets to everybody. But, yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to out no, you like okay. this. I, I had no, <laughs> I had no plans for this. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean it's such. There's some really good deals on there. If you look up backdrops on uh, Amazon, you'll see all sorts of cool stuff. So. Yeah, man, that's good. That's really cool. I really like that. So uh, that's awesome. So again, welcome to the show. So great to have you. And you. I, I, I'm really excited to to talk with you about some things. And I, I have some very natural questions for a guy who I, I love being a guy. I love being a dad. I love being a husband. I love being strong and working out. It, it just, it's funny because we started the podcast a little bit later than we were hoping to today just because I was out in the gym working out. Uh, in a live video. And so I'm all sweaty, like just sitting down, like, let's go, let's crush this podcast. And uh, so, you know, it's like I go from workout to a podcast and that's just life. And that, But that's what makes it fun. And I, I get so energized when I work out, when I exercise and stuff. My question I want to start with you as young Rustin, like, what was your childhood like? Like, what what fed this? What, was it was it your dad? The relationship you had, maybe with older siblings or or friends or something that kind of facilitated this? Like my fitness lifestyle, or just kind of where I'm at? Yeah, yeah, just this passion or love for for movement and exercise and being in shape. Yeah. So it might sound a little different than a lot of people. Well, I don't know. So I actually came from kind of a broken home. And um, my father was uh, an abusive father. And so I kind of grew up with this mindset, I think, of wanting to be able to defend myself, my, my two sisters. I was a middle child. I had an older and younger sister um, defend my mom. So I think there's some inner dialogue of me saying, hey, if I get bigger and if I get stronger than my dad, like I can, I can protect my family and myself. So I think that's truly deep down where it stemmed from. Um, now, I was an athlete my whole life, and I loved the training aspect. I mean, I was more in love, I think, with the training aspect than even just just the sport itself that I was doing, whether it was uh, I was a sprinter. Um, I actually went and sprinted in college, and I also golfed, um, which is funny because I was training. That's when Tiger kind of hit the, hit the, hey, everybody should be lifting weights. And so I jumped on that bandwagon. But... Um, truly, it came from kind of a, a more survival mechanism than anything else. And then they kind of blended, right? My passion for training and loving what it can do to the body and the responses you can get from that stimulus to the survival side. Uh, they just kind of blended. And I think that's kind of the childhood origin of, of everything. Yeah. I feel yeah. like it can go one of two ways for, for guys uh, when they come from that experience uh, in their younger years. When you're in an abusive situation, right, or, you know, maybe not the safest environment for a kid or, you know, you're, you're disciplined, uh, you know, with physical discipline right. um, that goes a little bit overboard. Those kind of, And I grew up that way, too. Um, I had a, a Marine Corps drill sergeant of a, of a father, you know, who's the oldest of four boys growing up himself. And so I think he was just always very much in charge and regimented his whole life. And then the, the Marines kind of fed into that, I think. And I learned a lot of good things from my father, but there, there was the abusive, you know, overly disciplined side. That, But I had my older brothers and my mom as buffers, and I was the baby. And so that was a huge help to me for sure. But I mean, so look at the, the man that you've become today, uh, a, a husband and a, and a father and, and seemingly just a, a really 
well-rounded individual. But it doesn't always go that way for guys where they come up, they come up hard and they stay hard, you know, and they're not maybe able to ever make that shift. What would you attribute that shift to that, that you were able to like be the, maybe the dad that you didn't have? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I, I knew going into like moving forward in life as I got out of the house, I always knew what not to do. And I always tried to, to kind of swing in the opposite direction of my dad where, okay, he was, he was aggressive and abusive and controlling. So I try to, you know, whether it was in a relationship or something else, I, I tried to be the opposite. Right. And that didn't actually serve me very well. Um, in fact, my first marriage that I got into, um, I was, uh, <laughs> I just, I, I was, uh, some people call the, use the word beta, but I would just say I was too passive. I wasn't um, the masculine man I should have been. There's all sorts of things that I, I didn't step into the roles that I needed to because I didn't see that myself, but I knew I wasn't being my dad. So I was like, okay, I'm doing good. Um, unfortunately, it, I ended up being on the other end of an uh, affair. My, my ex was um, having an affair while I was building my gym uh, way back in the day. And, um, you know, I for for a minute there, I wanted to just blame her on the situation and everything. But then it started to to dawn on me, like, man, I need to look into. Obviously, I wasn't doing something right. You know, I wasn't creating attraction. I wasn't stepping up in my masculine form, and I wasn't doing a lot of things I could have been. And so I started deep diving, reading book after book after book. Uh, I got a life coach um, through Tony Robbins, um, all sorts of different things to really start understanding where I could step up and, and be a man. And that's when everything kind of changed. And that's kind of how the muscular gentleman uh, took, took form. So we can talk about that later, but yeah, that's, I, I think I didn't really know. I didn't know what it looked like to be in a healthy relationship, you know, watching my dad. Um, I did have coaches throughout my life that really stepped up and, and showed me what masculinity looked like, which was really helpful. I think that kind of divinely showed up into my life in more ways than one, which was great. But um, it was a learning process and a lot of stumbles, you know, and falls on my end. Yeah. And, you know, those are good things, too, in our life. Uh, you know, in terms of those are lessons well learned often when we need to in go through things. Uh, we need to fail. We need to learn how to pick ourselves up and sur find people to surround ourselves with that support us and, and can move us in the right direction. And that can be done. Like you said, you got a, a, a life coach through the, t like a Tony Robbins, uh, mentorship program or something, which I, something like that, whether it's him or, or someone else, cause there's a lot of very helpful people out there that are, uh, in, in that industry. Um, that, that sounds like that was the, uh, the, sh the kick in the pants that you needed to, to really change the trajectory of your manhood, so to speak, or your, your life. It, it did make a big difference. I'll never forget one of my calls. I was in a parking lot and uh, in my car and I was talking to my coach. And, um, you know, from, and I don't know if you experienced this from, from having kind of that kind of father, but it's interesting the dialogue we l learn to tell ourselves or the, the language we use to talk to ourselves. And mine was pretty rough. It was pretty stern and pretty harsh on myself. Like we're our own worst critics, right? And I remember sitting in the car explaining a situation that I was in and just feeling frustrated with, with life. And he stopped and said, Rustin, if you change your language, you'll change your life. But he goes, your language to yourself is terrible. <laughs> like it's terrible. And uh, I ended up, you know, writing down how I talked to myself several times. It was kind of a, a little like homework assignment to just write down what, how I was talking to myself. And it took a minute to figure out how to, to start writing because my brain's like, this is weird, right? But uh, eventually I started just writing and I started reading what I was writing. I'm like, man, that is, that's not good. I mean, it didn't, it, I was harsh on myself. And so I learned to change that language and that was a big part of it, right? Is, is how you talk to yourself. It's just, we don't even, I don't think most people are, are aware of, of the thoughts we just kind of flood our brain with on a regular basis. That self-talk, that internal conversation that we have and the language that we use, I would say that's one of my greatest weaknesses mm -hmm. is, is the, the, the harshness, uh, that, that I s s seem to put myself through. Right. 
for the smallest things. Like I'll call myself an idiot or a dummy, right? Or like, why would you do that? What the heck? We, you know, it's just like so, so critical. But if someone else talked to me that way, I'd be like, whoa, yeah. right? <laughs> yep. But I'm so accepting of myself doing it. It's 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 so true. And I have my three year old son. His name's Rustin too. So we have the same name. And I've actually caught myself where I have inner dialogue, but I sometimes will say it out loud. I'll be like, Rustin, what are you doing? And I'm talking to myself, and my son will look at me like, what? I wasn't doing anything, Dad. And I'm, I'm like, doing anything, Dad. oh, my word. <laughs> I'm totally affecting him and giving him dialogue, which, you know, is a kind of an eye-opener for me, for sure. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. 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 He's at the age two, at three. Oh. You know, he's he is seeing everything and hearing <laughs> yeah. everything that you do, man. Yep. He is a sponge. Everything, everything, so fun. <laughs> but that's when they can really. That's when they start really becoming so fun because they can, they can do stuff now. They mm. can go places. They can have good conversations. You know, they got good, good uh, vocabulary at that point. Yes. And, uh, it's it, it's so fun, and uh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, you have a, you said you have a three and a two. Yeah, I have a two year old boy, a, a two year old and a three year old boy, two boys, and, and then you an eight year old daughter. Uh huh. Eight year old daughter. Right. Wow. Yeah, man, that's fantastic. I love it. So you spent, you got into this gym. You, was that something you saw yourself having like younger because you loved the, the gym environment? You saw yourself becoming like a gym owner. One day I'm going to have my own gym. Is that kind of? Yeah, I went, you know, I went to school. Uh, I went to college. Um, I went to a couple colleges, but I ended up finishing at, at, at CU um, and then got a master's degree, like you said, in, in human movement. And I always wanted a gym. I started training uh, back in 2001 as a trainer at a 24 hour fitness. And, uh, this was back in the day when it was fun. <laughs> they paid well, you know, it was, it was a, it was a good time. But, um, I, even once I started as a trainer, I immediately thought, man, it'd be really cool to have my own gym. And then once I opened my gym, it turned into, I want multiple gyms. And then, and then COVID kind of reeled me back and, and changed actually, you know what? It happened for me, not to me, right? That there was a really cool thing that happened where I kind of reset my focus and my career. But, um, but yeah, I, I think I always wanted the gym. It was kind of a thing uh, on my bucket list that I just envisioned. And I know I wrote it down several times, something I wanted. Yeah. Well, it's, it is, it's one of those things like we have our, our own private facility. It's not open to the public, but we do a lot of like open workouts where we have friends and family come and we have uh, these fun days. And obviously we use our facility for a lot of filming on YouTube. If you're listening to the Strong by Design podcast and you want to see other stuff that we do here at Critical Bench, one of them is we're very active on YouTube. We have, um, actually we have three channels now on YouTube. One of them is for the podcast where we put all the the recordings of all of our podcasts uh, go onto YouTube, and that's the Strong by Design podcast channel. But then we have the Critical Bench main channel, and then the Critical Bench Compound channel. The main one is <clears throat> hit just this year hit over a million subscribers. Um, I that's been a huge. I mean, it's like my baby, <laughs> the channel. You know, and I started here at Critical Bench. We had four thousand subscribers. Wow! And and I've seen it grow to over a million. So you know, you can. Imagine like the the attachment I have to it, you right. know, and all the blood, sweat, and tears, and and years of content, because um, I manage it, and but I'm also in it, you know. It's like so, it's it's, but it's fun. Like it's still fun for me. <laughs> I still enjoy it. I still like doing stuff with coaches, with other, with guests that we have by myself, and and delivering that enthusiasm and passion for exercise, much like what you have, mm -hmm. and to other people in a way that they can. Do whatever they want with it. It's it's free for you to consume. You can l leave it, or 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 follow it, or whatever. But it's out there, and it's it's really grown into something that's that's so much fun. So go over to YouTube sometime and check out Critical Bench, and you'll you'll love it. Um, that's a little a little side plug for the for the YouTube channel. A little side plug. Didn't know I was going to be plugging the YouTube today. But, uh, it's it's so fun because now my son is ten years old. He wants to be like a YouTuber, uh, you know. So he's doing his own little YouTube videos now. And they're all usually like sports related, like baseball stuff, because he's really in the baseball, and it's it's fun. It's cute uh, to to see him enjoy and have a little bit of enthusiasm for it. So tell me right now if you can put it in the words. Because I think part of being like a man is 
is being um, is learning how to be humble and learning how to be kind and learning how to uh, step in, step up and and step in to your manhood mm-hmm. and like ma- mature. In other words, right? Because we all think we're real men at 20, oh, yeah. right? Like we've arrived. We're manly. <laughs> you think you know everything. And what you what you learn is like, gosh, I was a real jerk when I was 20. You know, yeah. you know what? You're like double that age. And you're, you're like, we're both in our 40s, you know, and, and we've gone through some things in life now. And right. we realize, wow, we did not know it all. And, um, you know, all the things that you thought were uncool at 20 become really cool when you're 40 talk to me a little bit about like stepping into that like 40 year old person looking back at your 20 year old self like what are some of the things you wish you could tell yourself oh man um you know i i definitely would dive into my masculinity right away which you know i Thankfully, I've always had that uh, urge to want to work out and lift weights and be healthy. And I think that's a huge starting point for because there's a lot of 20 year olds and now that they don't even prioritize that at all. And I definitely think that's one of the major ways of just maintaining your masculinity is that discipline to work out consistently, to eat healthy and prioritize your health. Because as you grow, you know, into through your manhood, you start to understand your purpose a little bit more. But if you have an unhealthy body to work out of for, towards your purpose, um, you, you really don't have <laughs> where far to go. And so I think that's a huge one. Two is is what I just mentioned was purpose. I, if I could have honed in on my purpose sooner and just really knew what that deeper purpose looked like, I think that would have been really transformative earlier on. Now, thankfully, I've I've kind of been able to navigate that now. But yeah, I wasn't in. It wasn't. Uh, you know, in my twenties, it was chase girls, get a good job. I'm going to become a millionaire in five years and retire at 30, (laughs) you know, this false narrative. But now it's like, Oh my word, I, I, I I serve such a greater purpose beyond myself. Um, it's a driving force for me to get things done. And it, it's a driving force to overcome a lot of excuses in our life that I think most people are missing. And, You know, I say this all the time, but so many people want to work the nine to five, collect as many toys as possible, and then they die. And, you know, my kids, if they watched that, they're going to they're going to be like, really, that's it. And I can see kids getting depressed um, in early on in in life because they watch their parents with that mindset. And to me, that's dangerous. It's they need to see their parents thriving for something way greater than themselves. And I think that's inspiring for kids. Yeah. Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think when when a child can pick up on their parents' passion and enthusiasm and zest for life that goes beyond material things, that's transformative for them. They realize like life's life has more meaning than like the house and the car, you know, which is such like a big look at me thing, you know, anymore. Uh, the, the comparison game that most of uh, most of us adults and we all do it to some level some people a ridiculous level <laughs> this is all they're concerned about but all of us on some level you know it's like you want to level up you want to measure up you want to be you know you want to be accepted among your peers as a as you've attained a certain level right but but that's that's not really what's satisfying at all that doesn't fill that hole I, I've talked about this. It, it, not even necessarily on podcasts, but just in conversation with Mike here and other people I work with about we, we've, we're constantly trying to fill these holes, right? These spaces, these voids in our life with stuff. And we realize like it's it's like it's like it's like you're in a boat with a, with a hole in it. Right. And the water keeps coming in and you're you're pitching the water out. But no matter how much water you pitch out, the water's still coming in. You're like, I can't seem to. I, I'm, I'm going underwater no matter what. It's never enough. And it's, <laughs> it's never enough. Yeah. You, there's something, there's another layer. There's another deeper purpose to my life. Mm-hmm. It's like, how can I be in service to others, to inspire others? I think it's just the way we can connect and help and serve 
uh, mankind on some level, I think, has goes. That's what starts to fill, I think, those gaps. Yeah. It, it, it's what I kind of talk to my, my men in my program about the difference between happiness and fulfillment. You know, yeah. people think that happiness is kind of one of the keys. And look, uh, a nice juicy steak can make me happy, right? I can, I can spend 30, you know, 15 minutes consuming a steak and I am happy. But that's fleeting, right? That happiness goes away quickly. Fulfillment is more like, am I actually helping change someone else's life? Because that's fulfillment. And like, yes, I'll find happiness in it, but it's also long term. Like it lasts. And um, there's a big difference. Yeah, you're not thinking you're not thinking about that steak days later no. like you are about the person who reached out to you that said, dude, like you just you totally changed everything for me like that. You'll never forget. Never. That. Yeah, those are the moments that, and I'm getting chills just talking to you about this. It, it, it does. It, it's fulfillment, and it's, and it, it kind of connects you to your purpose, and it just starts, kind of, um, I guess, stacking on itself, to where you, you you don't understand what what else you would even have. What else would I be doing unless I was doing this stuff, whatever that might be? And everybody's different, you know. Um, but I think if everybody were really to hone in in their 20s on their purpose more, um, or at least figure out a way to uh, move toward it, right? You might not know right away, but what are the things you can do to move toward it? And I think it is, it's, it's, it's working out, eating healthy, figuring out how you can help other people. And it sounds kind of simple and cliche, but it's just, you know, it's the direction you got to take your life. Yeah. The, the, the simple lessons usually are the, I think the most meaningful typically uh, we, we tend to put brush them aside as if they don't matter as much, but that, that, I think they're everything. I think when you break things down to its simplest form, its simplest parts, that's that, that, that it's, it's not supposed to be complicated. It's supposed to actually be that easy. Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> we, we complicate oh, yeah. it. We make things harder than they need to be. What's, what's one lesson or, 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 thing that you've learned from as a father like having three children what's one thing how have they made you a better man a better human mm. being patience oh my word yeah um you know they're just they're incredible and i think for me it's it, i i never fall too far away from the comparison of what i grew up with and and what i had to endure to how do I make that experience for them so much different than my own? Um, but I also don't want to swing the pendulum so far in the other direction that I'm this passive, withdrawn father, which what I consider weak masculinity, right? You're just totally withdrawn um, and, and passive. I still think, you know, as a man, I serve such a different purpose than my wife. And that's something that I've learned is, you know, she, she is this nurturing feminine energy that just, I mean, they are drawn to that safety and I'm still the safety, but I'm more like, uh, well, I'm also their like play gym, right? I'm there. I'm there. I'm there oh, I want to play. Let's wrestle dad. But, um, I'm, I'm that side of, of discipline and decisiveness and assertiveness. I'm, I, if I bring out these masculine qualities, it's like, man, do they look up to me and, and we are, we can be their hero. And I, I see a lot of men come in my program and they're like, man, I'm, I'm completely out of shape. I can't keep up with my kids. Um, I don't feel like they look at me like they, they should, you know, things like that. And, and then we start working and within like 30, 60, 90 days, all of a sudden they're like, man, my kid is so impressed. They're eating what I'm eating. They're, they're wanting to work out with me, but we're just this incredible influence and, you know, I think we're going to mess them up no matter what in some way. I mean, like someday my kid's going to be on a couch with a counselor going, my dad did this. And it's like, yes. what do yes. I want him to say about me? <laughs> you know, oh gosh. I have flashes of moments where I've just really sucked at being a father that come to my mind. And I know those are the things that they're going to remember. Hopefully they forget some of them, but that. You know, it's just it's our our failures as 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 people as human beings. Uh, we we are flawed. Um, but the the one one of the lessons, and you said patience, obviously at the start of that, but that's definitely something for me. And it's also knowing when to say that you're sorry for letting your aggress aggressive reaction or overreaction to something. I tend I get it from my dad. 
like I said, he was a disciplinarian and he would get hell bent on the smallest thing. And, and I will too, but it's acknowledging that you did it and being able to go over to your kid and just having a quiet moment with them and just letting them know. And it's like, you know, daddy messed up there and I'm sorry for that. And, uh, I'm working on it and I'm going to try and do it better next time. And, and we, we got to let go of that pride. Um, and it's okay to like say you're sorry to like your seven year old or your eight year old or your ten year old. It's it's okay. It's you mess up too. Just like and it's good to teach them that you know we all mess up. Even when even when you're a mommy and a daddy, you can mess up. It's how you respond to that mistake. Right, the reaction. Yeah, I uh, I actually kind of uh, talk about what I call a golfer's mentality, which is funny because you know, so many people don't golf. But if you look at the best golfers in the world. They have this incredible ability to, they can hit this unbelievable shot, and they put it in their in their memory, their, this bank account. The next shot might be just the worst thing you've ever seen. They won't even show it on TV, or it's a blooper reel on on you know social media, and they will forget it. They'll just they'll they'll be frustrated and irritated in that moment, and then they let it go. And for me, that golfer's mentality as a father is kind of like okay. All these incredible moments I've had with my kids and I've presented these fun times with them or or like connections, really deep connections with my kids. I put those in my bank account. I put that in that memory bank and I don't forget it. And then the times where I screw up, instead of having that that bad language that I use on myself, I just I forget it. It's like it happened. And like you said, you know, it, it might be like, hey, I'm so sorry, buddy. Like <laughs> dad shouldn't have done that or whatever. But then I just move on. Right. Because it. It's like I could beat myself up so quick <laughs> because daily. I mean, I mess up daily, uh, something little, you know. And um, but yeah, I think that that mentality of just put the best shots or the best moments and just keep those and pull pull from them if you yes. need to. I love that bank account mentality. Store st store those good ones away so when you need to draw on something for strength or whatever, you can you can. You can go make a, a withdrawal on some of those good moments. Right. Yeah. 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 So you don't have to golf no. to do that. You just just understand it. Yeah. But you know what? There's but, some, uh, there's some golfers listening here, and I I am I am <laughs> anything but a golfer. Okay. I am not. I do. I love to go to a driving range. I've done some like little three you know three par or par three type stuff down here. But I am, but I just, I feel like at one, at one moment in my life, when I'm a little older, I'm going to finally get out on the, on the links and, 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 and play some golf on a regular basis. Cause in Florida here, golf's pretty big, pretty big here in Florida. Right. Um, what's your best score ever on 18 hole course? Uh, 71 is my best. I, um, I actually, I went on a, a scholarship down in Florida by you in West Palm, uh, my freshman year of college. Ended up quitting the team and then running track as a sprinter in Boulder at CU. But, um, it, yeah, I got down to a three handicap, and uh, it was a legit three. You know, some people say three, but it was it was a legit three for college. And then I've been chasing that that handicap ever since. <laughs> of course, of course. That's pretty, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, not bad. That's awesome. So you're almost like a scratch golfer is what? Like that's somebody that's yeah. Their average is going to be around you know a par and on most courses. You know on most courses. So you're just just a little bit above that. Yeah, I sh I'd shoot like a lot of seventy five, seventy sixes, things like that. Yeah, that's pretty awesome though. But so you can go to more most co courses and at least shoot get like a shoot like a. It, what 80 80 mid 80s yeah now i'm not a three anymore but now it's 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 yeah i'll shoot mid 80s on most courses and then and then i'll break 80 on courses i've played a bunch you know yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great yeah. i mean the, the great thing about an activity like that is you know you're outside you're walking you're moving it's beautiful these courses are beautiful they're they're real like you know it's like you've it's like you've gone somewhere you're in a paradise right on some of these golf courses they're so beautifully maintained um so it is an activity that i desire to do at some point in my life it's just i end up being on the baseball field a lot with my son sure. so it's not much time for golf no, it, one of these years one of these it years. is it's an escape and it's really nice because you know you play basketball it's the same court or it looks the same right you go to these courses and you're like they're all different they're all manicured and just i mean it's such a cool experience for sure. 
Yeah. Oh, I hear pe- I've gone out to San Diego and I hear people like, oh, you know, the, the what's the big course out there on San Diego on the water? Oh, you, you, you oh, put, it's the, one of the famous. Pebble Beach. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. People are always talking about going golfing there. When when I'm out there for like a business trip, they're like, oh, we're going golfing. You coming? I'm like, dude, I, I'll shoot like a one. 15 like you don't want me out there you don't want me right right and that's like uh, i can't remember i think it's uh car near carmel but yeah that's like 500 dollars to go play a golf course oh yeah it's it's a couple of bucks bucks. you gotta save up for that one yeah yeah. right (laughs) well that's awesome yeah i didn't you know i i want to because you're a golfer by the way we're talking to a guy who's a titleist performance institute level three golf fitness instructor Okay, so that's a mouthful, but that's that's pretty awesome. Along with your CSCS from the NSCA, which, by the way, is certified strength and conditioning specialist, which actually my wife got. She was a kinesiology uh, kines- kinesiology easy for me to say major uh, at Kansas State University, and um, that's what brought her to Florida actually. And we met over over by uh, West Palm in Boca Raton, a little bit south of West Palm. And uh, we met back in early 2000, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was fit- fitness brought us together. We met in a gym of all things. She came in to like take a, a fitness class uh, with a friend of hers that she worked with, and I was working the front desk. You know, I was a trainer, and I worked the front desk, and I worked at a YMCA. I had like multiple jobs, and we just hit it off. And she was friendly, and uh, started hanging out, and. Sure enough, it's 20 years ago. Boy, you know, that's it's crazy. crazy. Time flies. That's all. Awesome. But um, yeah, man, uh, and and you got your FMS level two, so you, you, which is a big part of your mobility work that you did with people for all those years, and and being a golf instructor and golfer, talk about mobility being like. I mean, you'll never be out of work, especially if you move to Florida. <laughs> you move to Florida, you have your pick of the litter with uh, working with improving people's golf game. Right. 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 Yeah, it's uh, the mobility side's huge. I think so many people neglect that. It's 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 not sexy, right? It's it's it doesn't uh, necessarily change your look, and so it's it's not the go to training method. But man, is it so powerful? Injury, it just pain. It, yeah, it needs to be implemented. Like you need some mobility work implemented into your weekly strength training habits and it's really easy to do actually if you watch our our youtube channel and uh or or go and and start following rustin and and some of the stuff that 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 um, he's doing i'm sure he has that built in to some of your programming and things the ways that you're helping men and we're going to get there in fact let's get let's go there now i want to i want to get to the to the real meat and potatoes of the conversation today, because I, this is just my opportunity to get to make a make a new friend and know this this man better. And uh, but I wanted to ask you about this, what seems to be an attack on being a man anymore. Uh, it, there's a lot of negativity associated with being a man uh, in, in today's day and age. It seems like it gets a lot of publicity and and talking points on, on different. Uh, stations and in and, and the media thing things that have been put out there in recent years um not good not not good for the men that you know there's it's like the, the bad apple that spoils the bunch you know and i think the bad apples get all the damn attention yeah. and it's quite frustrating for us good apples right, right. <laughs> us, us guys that are living our best life and being good husbands and, and fathers and trying to get men to step up and be be good men uh, in their communities. So wh- why are why is there this attack in in, in your opinion and this to- toxic mas- masculinity becoming such a thing now? Man, it's it's such a tough subject because honestly, it's confusing on the if you're trying to find the origin of of where this is coming from. And I actually just did a podcast. Um, if you don't mind me plugging, if you want to check out the Muscular Gentleman podcast, I just did one with uh, a PhD in political science. His name's uh, Nathaniel Bork, and he was man, that guy was a genius. But he he really dives into the history of the woke group, um, these political parties, the left, the right, and and in the episode, he just kind of he he talked about everybody. 
but he talked about feminism. Um, he recommended a book called Who Stole Feminism, and kind of its more main purpose of why it was even uh, and you know came out and and became what it was. But now it's just shifted in this insane direction. Um, and you know this, right? The left has changed. I mean, everything's shifting in all these different weird directions. But it's almost like they want masculinity just to be gone, right? They don't want you to be a patriarchal figure at all. They don't want family. They don't want the construct of family to be, to exist. And all these different weird things are taking place. But he actually kind of uh, broke that down. He said the woke's actually about 8% of the population. It's not this huge. We, we see it and we're, we think it's everywhere, but it's actually a small portion. And But he actually kind of explained, yeah, masculinity is being attacked not they call it toxic just for being a man. You're toxic masculinity. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really interesting episode. Very uh, informative. But um, uh, that's a very unfortunate. When I teach in my men's program, The Muscular Gentleman, I actually kind of have a, I have a graph. Okay. And it's if, you, if in your head you drew a line across a piece of paper, in the middle of that line you would write true masculinity. Okay, and that what that means is masculinity is simply just characteristics and qualities that men hold, and it doesn't mean that a woman can't be those characteristics or 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 hold those and use those, but those characteristics look like strength, obviously a big one, strength physically and mentally, uh, assertiveness, decisiveness, disciplined. Uh, there's all sorts of there's. I'm actually writing a book right now. There's 50 masculine traits that men can really. Uh, carry and utilize um, that we just have access to. And the question is whether we want to uh, use them, right? Or level them up, kind of exploit them. Now, in the middle of that graph is true masculinity. If we shift it all the way to the far left, it would be weak masculinity. So you took those those true masculine traits like discipline or decisiveness or whatever they might be, and you shifted them into a weak state, which would be like withdrawn, um, uh, you know, passive, quiet you know you you you're not stepping up into your masculine role and that's what would be considered weak masculinity and then my version of of toxic masculinity is if we went back to the middle it's a true masculinity and shifted to the right under that toxic uh category might be a trait that you had like assertiveness or discipline and you shifted it into a toxic state which toxic means uh poison right and so we would be more controlling or abusive um things like that. So that's where the toxic, and that's where my version, and I think most men that I work with agree, that's what toxic masculinity is. But unfortunately, societies, it's just saying, look, you're a man and your masculinity is toxic. And it's really, it's frightening to, and thankfully it's not as, I think, at least based on my last podcast, it's not as scary as I kind of thought, but it's still out there. And it's still something that's moving in a direction that's in the wrong direction in the wrong direction it does seem like the, the the fringes seem to get a lot of the attention nowadays where you know if you go back just a decade or two um it wasn't that it that wasn't the case you know the less than one percent getting all of this fanfare and and conversation going uh, all the time it's like why are we constantly focused on the one percent can we can we please focus on the other ninety nine right, right, a little bit and, 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 and let the one percent just figure it out a little? Just go hang out on an island somewhere. You guys, let us know how it's going. We'll kind of pick pick up if, if there's anything beneficial. But yeah, it's it's a very interesting topic, and and it's one that I wanted to address because it was something that I struggled with. I didn't get um, I didn't get modeled or demonstrated true masculinity, and so I had to search it out and really dive deep into what it looked like. And then when I was going through that process, that's where the muscular gentleman kind of originated as going through it. And I was taking care of my body. I was working out consistently. I was, I was doing all the things to just level up. And it was interesting because at the time I was going through a divorce from, from what I had gone through. And, and my ex actually literally took all my food from the fridge and threw it onto the lawn. And she was just like having a fit about me moving forward and really stepping up my life and and becoming the man I was supposed to be. I think it, it, it intimidated her and it knew I was going in the right direction because I knew I was stepping up and I was I might have caused some chaos. This happens with a lot of the men I work with. I start getting them to eat healthy and lose weight and the spouse sometimes will kind of um, I think out of fear right and and intimidation just get um, 
hard to deal with because they're they're like, well, are you going to leave me or what's happening and and how come you're you're going in this direction? We we were comfortable being in this maybe even unhealthy state of just out of shape and eating junk food and things like that. So it is an interesting thing to to see happen to myself, but see other men go through it. But it is something common. I'm going on a tangent, but but yeah. So these traits are something that I think we have to learn to pick up on and then and then uh, exploit them, right? As men, leadership is, is a huge masculine trait. Um, and it's it's funny, it's it's not so much, okay, and now I see the traits, but how do I actually improve them? Um, how do I become more decisive? One thing I teach my men is, how many of you guys have heard the conversation between you and your spouse, what do you wanna eat today or tonight? And every guy's like, I don't know, what do you wanna eat? And then the wife's like, I don't care, you pick. And guys like, no, you Right, back right. and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Just yes, somebody got and that feminine woman. Look, if you want your woman to be more feminine, you have to be more masculine. That's how it works. They feed off of you. And so I tell my men, look, just decide what to eat. Just be decisive and decide. And she doesn't have to agree with you. She might say, no, I don't want that. No, but she'll, she, she will subconsciously be very yeah. happy that you made, a, you made a selection for something that she didn't really care that right. much about. And, and, and you just pick it's something. so funny. I had a conversation with my wife. She's like, you know, I don't always know what I want, but I know what I don't want. <laughs> and so that's what it is, right? I get decisive with her and I'm like, well, let's go out to Mexican food. And she might be like, no, I feel bloated or this or that. And I go, okay, well then let's throw in some sweats and rent a movie and get some pizza. And she'll be like, yes, that's all right. That's what I want to do. Right. Or no, I don't, but I just keep putting out an option and deciding. And it, I swear it just keeps her in her feminine which creates polarity and attraction, right? And so decisiveness is an example that I use as far as something you can do as a man to just start just, you know, and then, and then it, 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 it infiltrates your work life, right? You become more decisive in other yes. areas and you're like, wow, yes. this is really working. Yes. It's funny you brought this up because this is something how we test candidates for working ah. here at Critical Bench is after they jump through all the different hoops in the interview process, we will go out to dinner with them and we are paying attention when it comes to them ordering their meal. And if they cannot just make a good, easy pick on like a dinner, that's a flag. It's like, dude, you, you're struggling with picking something on the menu. <laughs> you eat every day. How's it going to, how, how's it going to go when you need to assign a, uh, assign a task right. to somebody, you know, and or get this done or get that done or hit this deadline and you're going to be you know you're right. all over the you, you just pick you, hamburger chicken steak you know what is it salad what do you want like just pick it and so it's just it is it's the, being decisiveness is one of our seven core values Perfect. here at critical bench i've talked about it before in past podcasts we have seven things that guide our business all our decision making, how we hire, how we fire, how uh, p partnerships, uh, programs, things that we put out there, they all are filtered through these seven core values. But decisiveness is, is huge for us. And underneath it, it says we are fast, massive action takers. I mean, GSD, yeah. you know yep. what that stands for, I'm sure. <laughs> You're a guy. The clean version is get right. stuff done. Uh, but we are we are massive action takers in terms of just like get it done. So oftentimes it's just about you know moving quickly on things and putting it out there and not always striving for perfection, but just get it done and you know and then you can always make tweaks down the line. Um, I think that's where people get stuck in life. They they it holds them back from greatness because they they just never see something to its completion. Because they get stuck on making right. decisions. Yeah. And, and it's funny when I bring that up, you know, I have um, different men in the point, like their wives will be like, well, if that's a masculine trait, you know, look, if you're a female and you, let's say you're a CEO or you work in the, you know, out in the field doing whatever, a hundred percent, you're going to put on these masculine traits. You're going to be decisive and assertive and make decisions. Like you're going to do these ma and there's nothing wrong with like having a man have some feminine energy involved with whatever that might be in his life isn't negative it's it's can the woman come home to his to her relationship with her man take off the masculine role put on her feminine and let the man be in his masculine that's kind of the point right it doesn't mean she shouldn't be using all these qualities it's not like 
pigeonholed into only men can do this, right? So I, I always want women to understand, look, you can be decisive and assertive and strong and all these things. It's, it, it's just make sure when you're in that relationship, if you want good polarization, you want attraction to really magne- be uh, magnified, that you, you relax into your feminine and let that man show up and be his masculine self, which... Yeah. yeah, I've heard in past, I forget if it was an interview I heard once um, on another podcast or, you know, it could have been an audio book I was listening to that there are a lot of these women out there that are go-getters, assertive, they're CEOs, they're leaders, right? But it's very re- relieving to them to come home and take that hat off and just be a, be a wife and be a mom and be, right, and just be the woman of the house and let the dad be the the guy kind of steering, you know, driving the car and, 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 and leading, leading the pack at home. Cause it's, it gets exhausting to do that all the time. Yep. And, and that's where we kind of step up as men and we're, we're kind of in a different role. We have a different level of strength and endurance for that kind of space. That's why it's masculinity, you know? Um, yep. but, but yeah, the feminine, you know, it's interesting cause it's more passive. It's more flow, um, receptive, you know, if you if you were going into the sexual side of this, you know, we're we're out there, we're putting ourselves out there. The woman is accepting and receiving, and so it, it, it is. It's it's creating that balance where you can have that in the in the right times. Because if I go to work, you know, as as an entrepreneur and, and business owner, I can't be feminine. I can't be passive and just go with the flow. I I have to make decisions, right? So. If I were to be in my feminine, whatever that might look like and passive, it's 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 at a different time. Right. Um, and so, yeah, learning that 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 balance. It is a balance. I, I think to my coaching, like I'm oftentimes the head coach on the baseball teams over the years here. And it's like I need to have a plan. I got other assistant coaches, dads, and if I'm just kind of like, I don't know, what do you guys want to do, right, today? Right. do today? You know, what drill you feel? What do you feel like doing, Jimmy? What do you feel like doing? It's like, no, like, hey guys, I got the plan. This is what we're doing today. We're gonna start like this. We're gonna do this for 20 minutes, and we're gonna do a little water break. Then we're gonna do, and everyone's like, okay, yeah, right, sounds good. Right. People like when there's a plan, yes. and there's like. When someone takes the, the, the leadership role, puts the hat on and takes charge of the situation, you know, and Mike and I, are, you know, Mike, the, the founder of Critical Bench, we're, we're kind of those guys. I am fine with someone else leading if you're a good leader. I will follow another good leader. No problem. If, but if you're not a good leader, I'm going to want to step into that role. And, and take over yeah. for you, and that's because I can. You, we can read that as leader, as other leader. Like we can read when someone's failing. <laughs> you can feel it, right? And it's true. It's like you said earlier. You know, if be decisive, just do it. And if there's a mistake, right? Maybe one of those coaches steps and say, "Hey, what if you think? What if we do this?" And you're like, "Yeah, okay, we can change the plan a little bit." But coming in with this decisive plan and knowing that it doesn't have to be perfect, and you can adapt with it. That's 10 times more powerful than just, you know, hey, what do you what do you guys want to do? <laughs> and I, I got to come back right. to because it was something I thought about several minutes ago. When my kids wake up in the morning or when I wake them up for school or whatever and I shake them and, and what's the first question they ask? It's not what do we have for breakfast? This, that, the other. It's where's mommy? Right. The, the, the kids do, do not care if I am home in the morning when I wake them up. And this is the other side of it, right? This is where kids need, they need the structure, but they also, mommy is mommy and there's no replacing mommy. And I can guarantee you when my wife wakes them up, their question is not, where's daddy? (laughs) (laughs) What are we doing doing today? They're very fine with mommy being there because that's that, that's that emotional, that's that bonding, that intimacy that they have with the mom that they just, they can have it with their dad, but it's just in a, at a different level. I feel like a different, different oh, place. It's, it's it's that nurturing feeling, that that different safety uh, mechanism. You know, we're more protectors. They're more just like this nurturing, safe space that you know it, it's absolutely needed. They need both so bad. It's they crazy, need yeah. yeah. They do need both. Uh, it, it also reminds me, and I bet, I bet you've heard this story at some point. It was over. It's a, it's a, I don't know if it's folklore or anything. No, I think it's actually a very real thing. There were these, um, 
these juvenile elephants over in Africa that were absolutely devastating this region. Like they were trampling, they were they were wreaking havoc, uh, fighting and doing all this stuff. And it was it was found that it was a it was a, a group, an elephant like large group or herd. I think believe that you call an elephant group a, a herd, a herd of elephants. But it was all juvenile males among other females, and they were wreaking havoc and destroying this this area. They, what they realized was they had to bring in. The, the, the big daddy, right? And they did. And they brought in the, the, the bull, right? The, the, big, the big leader elephant, right? The male. And he came in and he straightened the stuff out. And all the juveniles came back in the line. And that whole herd f- fell, fell in line under the leadership of that one big, strong, powerful elephant. So that it's kind of like the, the, lion, the, the male lion and the pride, right? The, the the pride is not the pride if they don't have the male line. Now, sure, the 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 female lines are the ones doing all the work. <laughs> they're doing all the, they're going out and doing all the hunting, right, and taking care of the, of of the babies. But they still they need that they need that one big male to to roar every once in a while and let everybody know po- big poppy is here, and and things are going to be a certain way. We need that structure, you know. And I feel like that's how men need to think about. Their sphere of influence, their family, their neighborhoods, their communities. Like we need to step up and be the coaches and the dads and the leaders at, at all levels of uh, that, that we that we live and function. I absolutely love that. And it's it's so true because I can't tell you how many I mean, almost daily. My wife's like, look, I can't get one of your boys to do this or that. And I need you to step in. And then I'm like, hey this is what we're doing. And my sons are like, okay, you know? And, uh, and so, yeah, it, it's just, there's something different about daddy stepping in and being like, Hey, look, this is the plan. This is what you, you need to listen to mom. This is what we're doing. And they, they'll listen to me. And she's like, how do, why? I'm like, look, I'm dad. <laughs> like, it's just a different role, you know, but they might, they might argue with mom a little bit longer than they will with me. It's like, all right, dad said we, we give up. <laughs> like, it's not worth it. <laughs> It's it's true, man. Sometimes they they just need to know something straight up, and and we we seem to have that capacity sometimes. Oh, but then there's 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 moments where my wife takes charge in something, and I can I can sit back. I'm like, she got that one. I I'm gonna be the nice guy here. I'm gonna be softy because mom is jacked up know, right it's now. It's almost scarier. Like she, it's almost it's all it, it kind of right. is. And, and that, I'm, I'm like a little nervous, <laughs> not, so I'm like, but I'm like, we, they can't have two of us. <laughs> right, right, right. So if she's in attack mode, I'll let her attack, and they'll, they'll, she'll settle stuff down with my seven and ten year old, and then everything's fine, and I lay off, um, and it works, and it works, and she knows I got her back because I, I'm supporting her by not saying anything. Right, really. right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying like, honey, too much, right. you know, or everything. It's just like, do what you got to do, babe. Um, yeah, you got my approval. I'm, I'm with you. I'm behind you. Uh, it's true what you said, too. The, I think a lot of men listening should, should really take this to heart because you might not be a dad. But the fact that your masculinity is so powerful and effective to, to be a coach for other kids that don't have a masculine or a father figure – um, is so powerful. Like, uh, you know, you Frank Rich, a uh, great example. He's a coach, uh, a baseball coach. And, um, and it's just the amount of influence he has on these kids is so powerful. It's so cool because we do have to step it up as a society, as men, and, and actually really get our masculinity out there to the world in a positive way, not this toxic. You know, I tell people all the time, my goal is never to just try to fight feminism or whatever group is out there. I have, I have no clue. I don't care. My goal is to just step it up and let people see what we bring to the table and how we can make the world a better place. That's it. That speaks for itself. I don't have to do anything about whatever group is out there. Absolutely right. right. Just step into it. And it's, it's action, not words. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's what would I say? Walk the talk, so to speak, you know, just, just be the man who you, you, you know, you're capable of being and that you, your family needs and your neighborhood and your community needs and uh, everything else can take care of itself. And I love it with coaching because when you ask most guys, you say, you know, who are the biggest influences in your life growing up? Nine times out of ten, a, after maybe one of their parents, 
uh, they're going to name a coach that they had. That like, and you asked, for, you brought up Frank Rich. Yeah. I know for certain one of his coaches, childhood coaches, is one of his go-to mentors when he thinks of like a, a great leader and a guy who really got the kids in line and 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 did it the right way. You know, it's 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 the tough love. It's 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 not loving everything, you know, approving of everything. It's putting your foot down. It's it's lining up those juvenile elephants in, in moments when there's seeming chaos and being like, no, this that's not going to go here. And this is the way it's going to be. And that's what we all need. These guidelines. We need these margins. We need structure. Um, and that's I think that's what it, what men especially are so good at when they're on their game, when they're at their best. They're they're good at bringing structure to the chaos. One of your best masculine traits is logic and reason. Okay. And women, it's emotion. It's emotional. You know, they can, it, which is good, right? We don't, some, some, so many men like make it this negative thing, but women's uh, feminine energy to be emotional is something we need in our lives. So rather than trying to push it away, you've got to learn to actually love it and, and embrace it. But, but yeah, if we can, be the man who brings that logic and reason to the table so much more structure can take place right with that leadership yeah. it's huge it yeah it's huge tell me more uh, about muscular gentlemen and what you're doing there with your uh, amazing platform and podcast yeah so the muscular gentleman is an online men's coaching program and i work uh with these men myself so it's, it's me and uh, these gentlemen, we do coaching calls every week, but I start all my men off um, in the program on food, getting them to eat what they should be eating and, and helping them really, this is going to sound crazy, but getting, getting them shredded, getting them into this like, like superhero type body that they think they can't have. Um, but you know, they're all, they all come from different walks of life, but we start with food and workouts and we build that discipline and we, and, and I get them on the right stuff to get them where they want to go. It's all things that I do myself. So I don't teach anything I don't practice or do. And it's fun. It's an in, it's a video-based program, but it's also one-on-one -on -one coaching with me. And then we do coaching calls in groups. And every week we talk about masculinity, relationships, mindset. We just dive in and it's like, look, how do we level up day after day as men and become better men, better husbands, better fathers, whatever, wherever we're at in life. And uh, it's fun. But the goal of the Muscular Gentleman is to be a movement where we, we really just, we embrace masculinity and we show it to the world and we just start impacting and influencing everywhere we can. And so, yeah, that's, that was the, the original intent and it still is. And then the podcast is just a spin, you know, another branch off of that, um, of that program to just continue to have discussions like you and I are about how do we become better men? How do we understand life better? You know, um, and just be humble and open to learning all these different things that can make us better. Without question, that's what makes us better men and more manly and and shatters that whole you know negativity that comes with masculinity is is us having these conversations and us learning from each other. Uh, and, ha you know, so many men, they, I'm in a, in a men's group where we talk on Saturday mornings uh, for an hour. Frank, uh, our buddy Frank Rich is in that group. It's about 15 guys. And, you know, every any given week, you know, you got anywhere from like six to all 12 or 15 guys showing up for this virtual call. And it's it's us talking about life and, and, and getting through difficult times and supporting each other and stuff. And if more men just had something like that, whether it was in person or virtual, uh, an intimate group of maybe three or four guys, um, uh, or it could be a larger group where you, you're actually communicating things and feelings. And, uh, I, I'm going through this right now. What would you guys do? You know, and, and, and uh, Gosh, I mean, we all benefit from this. It's it's and you're doing this is what you're doing. You're 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 basically you're coaching men on, you know, living a more you know disciplined, structured life get, that's results driven, right? And how when you focus on the the the, the body, to some you know it, it it affects the the mind. It affects the two are obviously so interconnected. And so when you can. And most guys want to be big and strong and get some muscles, right? And when you can dial that in, now they start to see, and there's that mental shift. I can do, I can use this structure in other parts of my uh -huh. life. 
yeah, confidence is big, right? Like the one of the first things most people see or feel even uh, from from starting to work out and eat healthy is confidence. Like, oh my gosh, I'm doing something really good for myself. I have a little bit of control over it. I can start to build on that, and that's the big thing. And, and to these groups, you know, like you have, and and what we do in the muscular gentlemen, men need other men so badly. And like, it, imagine if you just surround yourself by women and, and your wife and you're just, that's all you're around. But then we want you to show up as your masculine self. Well, you, you don't have a lot to glean from, right? And, and you're around so much feminine energy. It's like you're expected to step into this role. But if you're a part of a group and part of a group where you're with other men constantly feeding off of each other, we have the strength to be able to really feed each other and build each other up in a different way than a, than a woman can. And it's not a bad thing. It's just the truth. But that's how you, that's how you bring more masculinity to the table in your relationships is being around other masculine men and gleaning from each other. It's just so important that I can't, I I can't emphasize it enough for, for people to find that where, wherever you need to look, but find it because that influence is big. Amazing. Where can our listeners uh, go and listen to? Uh, obviously, your your podcast is the Muscular Gentleman Podcast, uh-huh. right? Yep. Uh, so, th- and that obviously is going to be on uh, pretty much any platform they go. They can yep. listen to that show. Amazing. And I, I want to go and listen to the episode that you were talking about with the uh, the political uh, science yes. guy there. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I just rolled out that. yesterday that one, so oh, it's a recent one. Definitely check it out; it's good. Oh, great! I will do yeah. that. And 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 then where else um, on like social, like uh, Instagram or any, any any other platforms where people can go find you? Yeah, you can find me on my website, which is themusculargentleman dot com. Uh, so you can go there, and you can definitely find me on Facebook and Instagram. It's just Rustin Webb, R U S T O N W E B B. If you just look that up, you'll find me. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm always open to, to talking with people about this stuff. It, it's, it's what fuels me too. You know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't put together the muscular gentleman as if I am the muscular gentleman, right? I, I feel like we're all striving to be that, that muscular gentleman. And, and it's a, a work in progress for every single one of us all the time. It never, there's no end to the journey. It's just a constant. But you know, if you ask my three-year-old son, what I do, he'll tell you he's a gentleman. That's, that's my job. I love it. <laughs> Which is well, cool. I, I'll, I'll leave you with this, and I, I, this is exactly what we've been talking about this entire episode is. And my my buddy Mike, who I work for, is a, one of my closest friends, right? So I get to work for my best friend. Um, he says it's it's not focusing on the goal; it's focusing on the process. And if we all just devote a hundred percent of our effort to the process, the the goal will take care of itself. You know, so just. Yeah, yeah, man. It's it's focus on your journey, not the destination, and you'll you'll get where you want to go if you're just living that out every single day and 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 walking the talk. Um, I love it, man. But dude, Rustin, I I can't thank you enough. You know, really love talking with you, man. And I can't wait for you to come visit down here. You can hang out with Frank and 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 me and come visit the the, the compound. Come for a workout. I'd love to. Go out for a big steak dinner, you know, yes, and do all yes. that fun stuff that, that guys like to do and fellowship <laughs> with each other, man. That sounds awesome. I would absolutely love it. That would be great. Yeah, that would be great. Listeners, another ter- – I told you it was going to be a good one. It was even better than I expected. Uh, so much good stuff discussed in, in today's episode here on Strong by Design. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we just love you. Uh, every week we release a new episode, and this one is uh, certainly – a terrific one and we uh, wish you well in the rest of your week uh, go and, and be that that uh, that strong person for uh, your 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 spouse for your children uh, what we've talked about all day be strong by design it's your choice you are created strong by design and then you have to walk that out live that out every day you get an opportunity to live your life strong by design so God bless you we'll talk with you soon